And uh, today, I'll speak about, uh, it can be said as like polytopes, real quadrics, and uh, moment angle manifolds. And that will be the subject for in today's uh, two lectures of today. And, um, and then maybe uh, on Wednesday, I'll pass to studying topology of moment angle manifolds. So uh, there are some references to the background material, um, which probably some of you know of. Uh, this is uh, the things which I'm going to talk about are basically joined with, uh, most of, of those things are joined with Victor Buchstaber. Some of them are also joined with Nigel Ray. Mm, and also, um, I rely heavily on a somehow new approach to moment angle manifolds, which is due to Meersman, and then later was used in the paper of Bossier and Meersman. <coughs> mm, it's called Real Quadric in CM Complex <coughs> Manifolds. Politics. So <clears throat> let's act up. They discovered some or new new nice features of moment angle manifolds, in particular complex structure on them. Which I think I'll explain briefly probably in the second lecture. So that Today I'm going to describe the following link between the three mm, things. The first is just simple, simple polytops, simple convex polytops. Um, it turns out that from a simple uh, convex polytop you can define uh, what's called complete intersection of real quadrics, real quadratic surfaces. complex space so that <coughs> there will be some um, um, surfaces given by real equations but in a complex space and so that they are complete intersections they will give, give rise to some, some manifolds with torus sections which are known to toric topologists as moment angle manifolds although it's not quite standard way of looking at moment angle manifolds. Um, it's quite different from, say, the original construction of Davis Yanushkevich, for example. Mm. So, um, basically today I'll describe uh, two possible ways of going around this triangle. Uh, the one way you start with a simple polytope, then go to quadrics, and then find a uh, that those quadrics are complete intersection and you can produce some nice manifold with torus sections which are related to toric varieties and symplectic toric manifolds and so on. And the other way is just to start with go the opposite direction. <coughs> start with a complete intersection of uh, quadrics mm, and then go through moment angle manifolds which they define <coughs> eventually to simple polytops. And uh, by going uh, either way around this triangle, you'll discover some very nice phenomena from convex geometry and from complex geometry eventually. As, as we'll see probably in the second lecture, those complete intersections, despite they are being defined by real equation, they give you actually complex manifolds. <coughs> so let's start. And So first we start with a Euclidean space. <coughs> and dimensional Euclidean space. And uh, assume we are given a set of vectors and a set of numbers, bi. So from that data you can define what's called polyhedron, um, an intersection of finite number of half spaces so you just uh, 
write down linear half spaces and linear inequalities and look at the intersection, what you get is what's called the polyhedron. And we make some assumptions then so that we assume um, uh, that um, the dimension of that set is, a, is that this set is full dimensional, also that uh, it's bounded. And finally, we assume that, but under those two conditions, you can say that P is a polytope, right? So polytope is it like a bounded polyhedron. It's a bounded set defined by linear inequalities. And we uh, further assume that actually those inequalities are the, the, the hyperplanes, the bounding hyperplanes of those half spaces are in general position. <coughs> hyperplanes. given by setting those equations to equalities uh, like are in general position so that means that uh, neither uh, that means that uh, you cannot find an n plus one tuple of those hyperplanes which meets at a single point. This is plus sign, right? Huh? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so that that implies that P is a it's not just a polytope. Those two conditions imply that it's a n-dimensional polytope, and the third one implies that it's a simple polytope. So simple means that exactly this general position condition that actually at every vertex n facets meet at every vertex. Um, so out of, of platonic solid three-dimensional polytopes, regular three-dimensional polytopes, for example, the simplex cube and dodecahedron are simple, while icosahedron and octahedron are not simple, because at every vertex of a, an octahedron, for example, there are four facets meet, and n equals three, three-dimensional. So, uh, but this assumption is slightly weaker than what we usually assume. Uh, we do not require, actually, as you see here, we do not require that there are no what's called redundant inequalities. So, uh, um, the number of facets actually is not, not in general, it may be less than the number of inequalities here. So the number of facets is at most m. Uh, because, I mean, some of those inequalities may be somehow redundant. So you can, for example, you can define, in, in, in two dimensions, you can define, say, foregone, the quadrilateral with four, uh, with four half spaces, like that. So the intersection is, but then you can add one extra redundant inequality, like this one. It will not affect this polytope, right? The intersection, so that, this is somehow, you can remove that one, and you still get the same polytope. So usually we assume that there are no such things, but in that approach, it would be convenient to have such things as well. So some of those inequalities may be redundant. So now we can write, so we denote fi equals the intersection of the corresponding hyperplane with a polytope. So there are exactly m of those things, and each fi is either empty or a facet. Uh, it, it, it cannot be anything in between that. For example, the, in, in general, the intersection of, of such a hyperplane with a polytope may be a phase of a lower dimension. But in that, because we assume that there is a general position, 
it cannot be a face of lower dimensions, either a facet or an empty intersection. <coughs> Mm. Right, so now, uh, now we can write that polytope uh, with a matrix. That's just a formalism, right? It's, it's, that's a formalism, basically, that, I mean, you want to, do not, to, to look at that intersection in, in, later, we'll need, like, to look at those hyperplanes, not just just you know, facets. Or, or a facet. Or a facet. It can be a, like a ah, oh. Yeah, that's what I said. It it, it cannot be like that. Oh. Because of the general position. Oh, because of the general position. What's the PN? Sorry? PN. Oh yeah, sorry. P is P N. <laughs> that's that would be interchangeable. Polytope. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> So once we once we made that assumption, we'll sometimes use P n instead of P. Okay. But P and P n will be interchangeable. <laughs> <laughs> so we can write that like that with a matrix inequality, component-wise, uh, where A P just a matrix formed of columns, or oh, sorry, of rows. You put those vectors AI as rows of your matrix, and you get the matrix N times M matrix. And similarly, um, similarly, BP is a column of numbers. So this is, this is again a column of of height m, and that inequality is assumed to be like component wise. So just that, that just a short, short form of writing the same thing. And it's also can be used to, you can look at this left hand side uh, to create, uh, to, uh, to define a map. Um, so we define a map from Rm to Rm, sending an x here to APX plus BP. That's a like a linear a fine map and um, it's a, it, this map embeds embeds P into into the, the yeah. Yeah. into the positive core or the generalized octant a set of coordinates just to fix the notation. Right? Because of those inequalities, what that map does actually, it embeds your polytope into this octal. Um, and now we look at the following diagram. Here we have P mapped into R, um, that's your IP map. And then uh, we look at this uh, octan as a portion space for the standard toro section on, on the complex space. Uh, that's a orbit projection, the most standard moment map of symplectic geometers. And now we pull that back. So we somehow restrict that orbit projection onto P, or but to say onto the image of P. That here is some, so that's an embedding, and that's also an embedding, which we know I z. So here, if you restrict that that projection map onto the image of P, you get an embedding of some subset in C M. That means you look at that as a quotient for the standard toro section on C M, the coordinate-wise toro section on C M. That space, uh, that that space would be a also TM invariant. So that P is a TM invariant sub space in CM. Now we can write 
Now, that would be uh, the, the main object of our study during, at least during these two lectures, uh, today's lectures. So, um, I'll try to convince you that, that that space is quite interesting, both topologically and combinatorially. Sorry? M, yeah, because, uh, because of those assumptions, actually, you, you can say that you always have that in order to bound a polytope by linear inequalities, you have to take at least n plus 1 of them. So, in fact, here you have m is at least n plus 1. I'll give an example soon. Um, yeah, so now how the quadratic, the quadratic equations come? Well, this, this somehow, uh, this map, this, so the image of that IP map is like n-dimensional plane in RM. Um, that matrix, uh, by obvious, um, because, because you, you, P is a polytope, that matrix is actually of rank N, right? So, you, you can, if you pick one vertex, then those AIs, you can think of those AIs as a normal vector to the corresponding facets meeting at that vertex. And so there, uh, there are many N-tuples here which are linearly independent. Right? So that, that matrix is, for every vertex you get an n-tuple uh, uh, of rows which are linearly independent. So that map is actually embedding, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's n-dimensional plane. And that n-dimensional plane so far is written like parametrically with parameters and parameters. But the other way to write down that plane is uh, to write the equations, right? And let's, let's pass to the equations. So let's write IP of Rn. That's the original way. But now we can, by solving the appropriate system of linear equations, we can write that like that. As a set of uh, points in RM satisfying a system of linear equations, like that. Where C is and so now uh, to write down an n-dimensional plane by equation with equations you need m minus n equations right so that the C is an m minus n minus m matrix whose rows constitute Basis in the space of linear dependencies between n times m or m times n? m times n times m. The m rows. But that y is always a column. This one is, is this the AP? Is this you say this is a M times M? This is oh sorry, that's that, that, that's wrong. <laughs> that was correct. That's M times M. Sorry. <laughs> That's exactly what you do when you solve that. When you try to write down the plane given by parametric, uh, written in a parametric form, if you try to write it down with equations, you have to solve a system of equations with matrix A and AP. So you have to find the matrix uh, whose, whose rows are basis in the space of linear, uh, linear relations between the rows of AP. Right? <coughs> So now, if you plug somehow, so in other in other words, uh, you can say that it more formally that is 
uh, uh, C is determined by those conditions that if you multiply, then you get zero. So that means that C is a like linear relations between the rows of A, and it's a full rank, so it's a basis in the space of linear relation. So then now, if you plug in Y here, then you get exactly C B P, right? So that that's how you write. It's the same plane with these equations. So then we can write. Then how can we write this that p, right? From that diagram, you just have to, you know, you have to lift into the CM, into the complex space. That means that you have to re replace here the, the the coordinates by the, the the real coordinates y by the square of complex square of modules of complex coordinates. So from that diagram and that um, formula, you get the, now the description of that that in CM given by the following equations. Okay, and that are exactly quadratic real quadratic equations we were talking about. You multiply C with that column of those that 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 gives you m minus n real quadratic equations. So this is a set of the set of common zeros of m minus m minus n real quadratic equations. Now, the first observation is that actually that set of real quadratic equation is non-degenerate. So let's say theorem, although we'll probably will not prove it here. Let's we have to do some. So let's denote that by star or by one. So that one is non-degenerate. Well, you have to check that. You have to write down that uh, th those equations, and then you have to take the gradients and check that at each point of that P they are linearly independent. The gradients are linearly independent, and by in doing that check you'll use the combinatorics of polytopes. That's basically comes down to that, that condition of those uh, gradients of those linear equations are being linearly independent. It's equivalent in a sense to the fact that uh, at every vertex of the polytope P, you have the, uh, the corresponding vector AIs are linearly independent. But that's not, not very straightforward, but still that's, that's, that's basically not, not, not so complicated to check. I have a proof here, but probably I won't have time to <laughs> maybe yeah later if the time allows I can add that proof okay so, so therefore let me is that TM variant smooth Manifold CM with equivalently trivial normal bundle. So, of course, you can act by the m torus on those complex coordinates. So that gives you an action of torus on your manifold. And because it's written as a complete intersection, so actually that means that, that the normal bundle is, is framed. Right? There's a framing, the trivialization of the normal bundle. So this, this, this way of writing that P gives you the framing in the normal bundle, and that framing is TM and TM covariant. <laughs> so in fact, well, in fact, 
uh, I would not try to just say that there are many choices of that framing, right? Many choices of trivialization of the normal bundle. And each choice corresponds to a choice of the matrix C. So this C, of course, is not unique. There are many matrices like that. And every choice of C gives you a choice of trivialization in the normal bundle. <coughs> Right, now, so out of a polytope, you get a manifold with a torus section and embedded in CM with a trivialized normal bundle. Well, that construction is basically geometric, right? So it depended on how we uh, embedded our polytope into the space. So, uh, I mean, you can think of, the, when you talk about polytopes, then there are two concepts of polytopes, right? The one is geometrical, but well, just given by, for example, intersection of li linear half spaces. And another one is combinatorial, when you just look at the polytopes as a uh, partially ordered set of, fa of, of faces. So you can say that two polytopes are combinatorially equivalent if the, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between their faces, which preserves the, the inclusion relation. So from that point of view, for example, the square and the like, arbitrary quadrilateral would be combinatorially equivalent. Combinatorial equivalence is actually, you just look at the face posit, the partially ordered set of faces of the polytope, and do not distinguish between polytopes which have same isomorphic face, face posits. Um, and as many of you know, many constructions of toric topology are actually independent on the geometry. They just depend on the combinatorics of polytopes. And this is also the case. Also, it's not in that case, uh, in the case of ZP, this is also true. But this is not clear at all from that construction. But as I said, this was actually the last construction of moment angle manifolds, right? So, uh, I mean, yeah, let, let me say that just uh, ZP. Sorry? There is no map. I mean, if there is an affine map between the two, then it also establishes a combinatorial. It, it also establishes a combinatorial equivalence. But so let's okay. Let's say that um, two polytops are combinatorially equivalent. There is a one to one map correspondence <coughs> their faces that preserves the inclusion relation. And then combinatorial polytope. a class of of combinatorial equivalents. Okay? That's the definition. Maybe just uh, just a homeomorphism. Yes. Yes. It's uh, it may be just a homeomorphism preserving the phase structure. Not necessarily a fine map. Well there is not a fine map between square, arbitrary, quadrilateral, <coughs> but they're still combinatorial equivalent. Do you have a, do you have a homeomorphism? Well, that depends on what do you mean by the homeomorphism. And of course, there is a whole. I mean, preserving the preserving the face, face structure. Face yes. Yes. Yeah, homeomorphism is not not difficult. That homeomorphism, uh, diffeomorphism, in an appropriate sense, is, ah. is a bit more complicated. Ah. I think even diffeomorphism. Okay. Homeomorphism is yeah. If homeomorphism preserving a face structure, yeah, that, that's that's also you can say it that way. And you said that P and P prime are combinatory equivalent, and that P and that P prime are yes. uh, what TM, yeah, I, I'll say TM, TM equivalent to homeomorphism. TM, TM. So let's let's call let, let's call Z, ZP a moment angle manifold corresponding to P.
And now, say proposition. Excuse me. My relation between uh, fiber product and ZP. Fiber product, not industry. industry. But ZP is and by, by definition the fiber product. Fiber product. No, not well, it's, it's sort of, but it's a very trivial fiber product oh, okay. when this map is an embedding. So it's just a restriction of that map onto the image. Okay. <laughs> you can say still it's a fiber product, but very reduced one. <laughs> So you, um, so you can get the homeomorphism between the uh, two point offset uh, because uh, the point of the simple. Yes, 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 simple. Because, of course, because, because, of, because of, of the simple, yes. Ah, yes. Uh, yes, 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 that's right. If, well, if they are not simple, then I don't know what is a homeomorphism. I mean, well, when you say homeomorphism, they're all homeomorphism both. makes sense. Yeah, homeomorphism makes sense. But they're not many for this, this corners anymore, right? So, but, yeah. well. But, we still can say that there is a homeomorphism preserving. They are not simple. Are there manifolds? Well, I mean, it's like... No, homeomorphism, we don't need manifold for homeomorphism. No, no, what I'm saying is they are... I mean, you need this uh, simpleness so that this is non-degenerate. One is here and one is... Oh, this is non-degenerate. Yeah, that, 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 that set of equations. Complete, it's complete that, intersection. So that, that uses a simple. Yeah, that uses simple, definitely. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah, by the way, that's a, that's a good remark. <laughs> because I was going to. So, in, in, in fact, you can write this one for arbitrary polytope. And that's an interesting question, which I actually was going to write. But, uh, of course, it will, it will not be a manifold. If, right. if P is not a simple polytope, then you just get some complete some intersection, which is a little bit singular. But still, it might be interesting. You have, you have somehow <coughs> some kind of TM space, right. singular one, which is not, no longer a complete intersection. So it's a singular TM space. But it is related to toric varieties, to singular toric varieties, in the same way as that, that one is related to non singular varieties. And so it, it, I think it's worth looking at this, at this space for non simple polytops as well. But that would be probably quite complicated. Well, even for simple polytopes, that's quite complicated, as we shall see. <laughs> but by some kind of graph. Uh, yes, that's right. But that's that's a theorem. I mean, a combinatorial type of a simple polytope. If the polytope is simple, then it's determined by its y one graph, one scalar. That's right. But that's that's a theorem of it. Well, Kalai, I think Kalai gave a proof, and a better proof, a simple, simple proof of that, but originally it's due to some combinatorial yes. ideas. <laughs> but that's not trivial. Yeah. <coughs> so the proposition is that um, if P is combinatorially equivalent, two polytopes are combinatorially equivalent, then the corresponding manifolds TM equivalently homeomorphic. I will not prove it now. Probably, if I have time, I'll prove it on the third lecture <laughs> on Wednesday because then we consider more general construction of what's called non-entangled complexes. I'll just give an idea. You can write ZP topologically as a that, that, that's actually the original construction of Davis and Yanushkevich, who actually introduced those manifolds, but under very different constructions. So you can write down that, that P is uh, the product of the polytope with the m-dimensional torus, and then you make some identification relation on that product. That's more, probably more, fam more, more familiar to many of you. That, that's, the, that's the original construction of the moment type of manifolds. From that construction, so you, 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 you impose some equivalence relation in that product. You'll, somehow glue some subtora here corresponding to the different points in the polytope and then from that construction that equivalence relation only depends on the combinatorial structure of that construction it's it's basically straightforward that that it depends only on on the combinatorics and then from it's also quite easy to see from that point of view that 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 we can be identified with that identification space so that's how you establish that from that construction, it's, it's, it's somehow striking. I mean, it's, it's not at all clear from the beginning that that should, truth, should be true. But since we came to that construction, already knowing that fact that 
it was not a big surprise, but okay. So ah, that's a good question. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of that's kind of rigidity. Yeah. So in general, this is this is this, this is not true. Huh? There's a converse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you put TM equivalent. If you put, if, yeah, yeah, if, 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 yeah, if, if it is TM equivalent, then it's true, yes. Yeah. But if it's just, just homeomorphic, then it's not true. Yeah, or diffeomorphic or homeomorphic, so. Yeah, TM equivalent, yeah, that, that implies, yes. So, yeah, that's actually, yeah, you're right. That's, you can only if you put TM equivalent here. Yeah. Huh? Uh, yes, I mean, here you can say diffeomorphic, yes, yeah, yeah. but that, that, that would require some extra analysis, I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's, that, that is true? yeah, this is true for diffeomorphic also, for diffeomorphic. yes, yeah, the, the, all the, this is true for diffeomorphic, but that, the, the proof will, will, will be more complicated for, if you do it for For, for homeomorphic, that's not complicated. But, but this size homeomorphic, and S and T, and T prime homeomorphic, that's the conclusion. P and P prime combinatorial equivalent. Homeomorphic equivalent means non-homeomorphic. Combinatorial equivalence implies here diffeomorphism, not just homeomorphism. Um, actually, yeah, then we change the homeomorphism to some kind, not directly, but try to change the homeomorphism to this side because smoothness is different. But I mean, here you have a very canonical smooth structure, right? Coming from that that presentation. Ah. Yeah. If you that, well, I mean, that doesn't mean that that thing may have some kind of exotic exotic smooth structure, and then that would be not true. But when I say diffeomorphic, I mean that canonical smooth structure given by those, that presentation. <coughs> yeah, there, there are some issues here with this difference between homeomorphic and smooth, but I don't want to go into that. that, that that's a <laughs> subject for a different lecture. I mean, something can be done here, and that's interesting questions, but it's different from... <laughs> Okay, so now, so okay, let's, now as we said, that matrix C is not uniquely determined, and we want some canonical way of writing down those quadratic equations from a polytope, and there are basically two main ways to proceed, so let's say how to choose how to choose C canonically. Well, the first method is the original one we, we used when we wrote that paper on cobordism of quadratic manifold. So that's uh, here we can assume that that first Facets F1, so Fn intersect at the vertex. Just we, we can enumerate those facets so that the first of n of them have a common vertex. And take their normal vectors. So somehow you apply an affine transformation for the normal vectors A1 through Am as the basis. Then we somehow think that, 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 that uh, up to a fine transformation, since we somehow already uh, basically <coughs> agreed that that doesn't depend on the on the on the uh, 
geometrical realization. So we can apply, for example, an affine transformation to a polytope, and that will not change uh, the manifold that P. So in particular, you can assume that somehow your polytope, here you can have some initial vertex, and the first n facets meet with, with the right angles, right? So that the normal vectors somehow form the standard basis of Rn at some chosen vertex, right? So then, what does it mean in terms of the matrix? The matrix AP, so here you'll have just a unit matrix, square unit matrix, and then you have something. Something which we denote AP star. So that's a, just the rows, right? The, the normal vectors to your facets. The first n of them is, are the standard basis, that our assumption. So that's n, n, and that's m minus n. And then, actually, there is a, under that assumption, C can be chosen canonically as, you just can choose those two conditions, right? You can take, and we can take C is the poly minus A P star E. That's exactly N, M minus N, and that's M minus N. Okay. Then you have to check that they might apply to zero. And of course, also that the rank is maximum. So that basically means that when you solve the system of linear equations, this matrix is already in like an upper triangular form, so like transpose to it is an upper triangular form. So. Not, not triangular, but how do you say like, okay. That's one method, but that, that uh, today I will not proceed this way. That, that's, that's, um, that's quite useful for some kind of a relationship, a relationship to quasi-toric manifolds and other things, but that's not the way which I'm going to proceed today. The second method is like still there is a right hand side here, right? CBP, which is like you can't say much about that even if you know C. So, but the second method somehow gets rid of, gets rid gets rid of the right hand side. So it, it makes the right hand side quite canonical. So second method for choosing C is as follows. So let's remember that C, that the rows of C is a basis in the space of linear relations between the vectors A1, A through AM. And the vectors A1 through AM are the normal vectors to, to the facets, to the facets of your polytope. So let's say, so, what, so to choose C, we want to somehow understand what are the li linear relations between the normal vectors, right? So you have the polytope, and you have the normal vectors A1, A2, and so on, AM. And, okay, first of all, uh, let's remember some kind of school geometry that you know always there is one linear relation. In fact, there is a relation like that. Alpha R1, A1, plus and so on, plus alpha M, A M equals zero for some positive alpha I. In fact, alpha I is equal to the volume of F I. So that's uh, like if for the polygon, that's very easy. If, if you if you take that vector a i of the length equal to the length of the corresponding h, then those vectors sum up to zero, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's like a square problem. <laughs> well, in the two-dimensional case, it's very simple because you just turn turns it by 90 degrees, right? So those vectors sum up to zero, right? And if you turn that by 90 degrees, then you get that the sum of the normal vectors whose lengths equal to the lengths of the edges right. also sum up to zero, right? But this is also true in every dimension. I mean, that's like it has some physical meaning. Like, for example, if you blow up the ball, like a football ball, then if that would not sum up to zero, then by the Pascal law, it would move. <laughs> like, so that, I mean, if you have an arbitrary, point of an arbitrary dimension, like a... Uh, like a simplex, and you take the normal inward pointing normal vectors. Well, in, in the physic, physic, <coughs> physical meaning, it, you have rather to take it uh, outwards pointing, so that then, um, kind of pressures. 
how the forces are like the pressure in relation between the forces and the so then those vectors actually if you take here the vector whose length equal to the square to the to the uh, area of the corresponding two dimensional facets then also they also sum up to zero well, that's a good question for undergraduate students. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not complicated to prove. For the, for the tetrahedron, you just you have first, first to prove that for the tetrahedron, and that, that's just some angles and projections. Mm -hmm. that's, and then you can split up arbitrary polytope into tetrahedrons, and then that gives you the proof, basically. Okay, it doesn't matter. So, for us, it only matters that we have such kind of relation. Um, that's if, if the norm of that vector is 1, that alpha is a volume. So again, but then in that presentation for the polytop, right? So let, let me write it down. Here, of course, this is a linear inequality. So you can multiply it by any positive constant, right? It doesn't change. So that means that you can scale those vectors, right? So in fact, by, cha by scaling, you can actually assume by scaling, you can assume that we have just A1 plus and so on plus A L equal zero, okay? So that would be our first standard mm, relation. So then that means that we can take, take C equals the following. So here you have C star, and here we have just one, so one, one, right? So that C is our matrix of linear relations, the co coefficients of the real linear relations between the I, A1 through AM. And this is, this is here we knew the one is canonical, just they sum up to zero. So that will be the last one. And now C is C star is M minus N minus one times N matrix. So now that P is given by C star and then here you have something and here you have B1 plus and so on plus B M, right? That's C times BP. So the last row of C, we agreed it just con consists of units. So then when you multiply, here you get the sum of the i's. Again, by moving the origin to the interior of P, we get if if that polytope contains the origin in its interior, that means that all bi's are positive, right? That b if we put zero here, then this is satisfied without equality, just strictly, right? So because it's interior, get bi is positive, right? For all e, for all i. And then again, by now, if you scale not the vectors, the, the, but the polytope, right? just in, inflated, like, mm -hmm. then you can assume that this, this sum is, is 1, right? That's just mm, changing the scale. Of, 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 uh, here, here you just, uh, you didn't change anything <coughs> by, in assuming that. Right? You just multiply the equation with some numbers. But now you have to, to actually, you change the polytope. You just shrink it or, again, by scaling the whole piece. can get B1 plus and so on plus B plus 1, right? And uh, finally, uh, what is star, star, star? this star is something. <laughs> what is C lower star? Huh? What is C lower star? C lower star is again, <laughs> that's a notation. <laughs> what remains from C? Is just, you have C, C is M minus N times M matrix, right? That's a notation. How do you choose C? C? No, C star? C. Well, we just, uh, we, we just made one, 
one assumption that the last row is the, of that one, right? And the, the other one is something. We, we choose, we choose, we, 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 we've chosen some C, right? And then we, we modify it. So then there are some other m minus n minus 1 relation, which we, so far we don't know what, what are they, right? I just want to play with, with that presentation to simplify it a bit, right? So the first simplification is that we can always assume that the last equation is just sum of those z1 square plus and so on plus zm square, right? And here, again, you can get it, instead of that, you can get 1. And finally, what you can do is just, uh, so the last equation is just that 1 square plus and so on plus that m square equals 1, which means that your zp is just an intersection of the unit sphere with something, right? And finally, <coughs> and subtracting, now we can subtract that with appropriate coefficients from all other relations. And we can kill all those stars here, right, to make them zeros. Well, we get the following final presentation of the P. we simplified it. First of all, there is almost no right-hand side, right, now, in that presentation. So that is how it's like homogeneous equations, without right-hand side. m minus n minus 1 homogeneous equation, and then one non-homogeneous, which means that you intersect everything with a unit sphere. Well, let's now do some example. Probably I have to finish with that. Also. <laughs> So, if P is a simplex, a standard somehow simplex, like given by the following equations, xi or i equals 1 through n, and also minus x1 minus x1 minus x1 plus That's how we write down a simplex, right? The coordinates are non-negative and also one equation like this. Then we have m equals n plus 1. So ai equals ei, the standard basis vector for e equals 1 through m, the standard basis vectors. And finally, a n plus 1 equals minus e1 minus e1 minus e1. So our AP is the following. It's unit matrix and then minus 1 so minus 1. Then for C, whatever in any any of those two methods which I gave get give you C is just the row of units, right? That's only one linear linear relations between those vectors. So they sum up to, to zero. This is your C, and so in that case, your ZP is just the unit sphere. That's the simplest possible case. It's that that's, that's M. 
So that's the unit sphere. Sorry, two n plus one. M equals n plus one. So that's two n plus one. Okay. So, so that's p equals like delta m. So if you start with a simplex, then you get an odd dimensional sphere. That's the most most simple moment angle manifold. And in that case, that C star matrix, the reduced matrix, is just empty. Because that's M minus N minus 1 is 0. OK, well, let me pr probably finish. I, I hope to do that. But I hope to finish. I'll just give some statements, which I'll probably prove after the break. And so that you can see how it there is some, as I said, there is some nice convex geometry behind that. So there is a lemma which telling you the following. So if you look at the intersection of the corresponding some facets in P, so in fact, let's 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 do the following. Let's let's see star matrix, right? Let's write it like that. C star equals, let's denote the columns of the C star matrix by C1 through Cm. So each Ci is in R M minus N minus 1. Okay? So somehow that C star matrix gives you a configuration of M points in that space. And that's a way, that's a, what kind of, you can realize your polytopes by thinking, instead of thinking of the facets and normal vectors, by thinking of the, the, the points. And that's what's called the Gale transform in the, in the, in the combinatorial geometry. Basically, the, and that, the, the, the properties of the configuration of that points, of these points, can tell you things about the combinatorics of the polytope itself. Namely, the following is true. The, the intersection of facets is non-empty in P if and only if zero belongs to the interior of the convex half of CJ is J is M in the complementary set. In other words, that is the, the configuration of points C1 through Cm in R M minus M minus 1 is a Gale diagram. That's the definition of the Gale diagram. Of, of the dual point. The dual polytope is simplicial, and it's a convex hull of those vectors. That's a dual simplicial polytope to P, right? And that configuration of points is like a Gale dual to that configuration of points. Or Gale dual to that point. That Gale duality is like that. So it's a, there's a, a set of points. So you can say you can that that condition f i one f i k is non empty in P is equivalent to saying <coughs> that a conf conf of a i one over b i one and so on a i k over b i k is a phase of P dual polar, right? The intersection of facet is a face of P if and only if the convex half of the corresponding points is a face of the dual point. So, and that's a Gale duality between that convex half and that convex half. Okay, so, and that, that somehow, from that property, you will be able to tell about combinatorics of P by looking at the configuration of points C, CJ. 
Okay, so probably I'll stop here and then I'll resume by proving that and then pass on to complex structures.